Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. I'm Mike Coletta. And I'm Tyler Osby. And today we are continuing our discussion of id Software. This is part six of our series. We're covering chapters 12 and 13 in the book Masters of Doom by David Kushner. And Tyler is going to kick it off. Yeah, so while Quake was having trouble getting off the ground, Doom was still out there crushing it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what, what's been going on with Quake as this goes on. But if you'll remember from, from the previous ones, Quake was kind of floundering a little bit. So, But Doom was still out there doing some work. In fact, the shareware version of Doom was installed on more computers at the time than Microsoft's revolutionary new operating system, Windows 95. How could this Ooh. be? At one point, Bill Gates actually asked Alex St. John, the chief strategist for Microsoft's graphics division, if they could straight up buy id Software. They were like, these guys are beating us. Why don't we just buy them? Um, which was kind of Microsoft's strategy in the 90s. If you can't beat them, buy them. And that's a whole history in and of itself. Uh, if we ever get away from doing video game stuff, like if we do go to adjacent stuff, um, Microsoft's history would be really fun to do because the 90s get uh, pretty crazy. Because um, like they're not the market leader now. Well, they are in like certain things in like Windows and stuff. But there was a time in the 90s where they were just this monster tech behemoth like bigger than any other tech company out there and they used to just gobble up their competitors like maybe they saw it as a competitor or something um well no they didn't see it as a competitor they saw them as uh someone that could that could help them um and uh it was making tons of money off games too so like imagine in like this alternate reality like a microsoft bankrolled id software in the mid 90s i don't think carmack would have liked it uh he wasn't really in it for the money he, he probably yeah. wouldn't have sold to microsoft he would not. Yeah, he would not have agreed to it. There's no way, right? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, yeah, because they were they were very proprietary. Like their their whole thing was like keeping all their stuff secret and then selling it. And he wanted to give everything away. I think if Carmack could have gotten by without selling games, he would have just made them for for free. But you know, guys got to make money, right? Um, got to make a buck. Yep. Um, so at this point in time, there are also a lot of other FPS games hitting the market. Uh, they were called Doom clones at the time because the thought of FPS as a genre hadn't quite hit the mainstream yet. It's it's funny when new genres like this are created because it's kind of hard to tell at the time, right? When other games come out that are like it, are they ripoffs or are they building on those ideas and expanding into like a genre of its own? Uh, but at this point in time, FPS games were like starting, they were just kind of Doom clones like Duke Nukem and stuff like that. Um, but they were creating a genre. Like Dark Forces from LucasArts was basically Star Wars Doom. Uh, we had Marathon from Bungie, which came out in 1994, around the same time as uh, Doom 2, uh, which was a little bit more of a story-driven FPS exclusively for the Macintosh. So who says Macs has no, have no games? Old Macs like we, got all the games. Old Macs did have a few games, and we did a history of Mac gaming, and uh, Bungie and Marathon is in there a little bit. So if you want to dig into the archives a little bit, you can find our history of Mac gaming episode. But uh, anyway... Doom was a hot commodity at this time. Uh, the roots of the Doom movie even go back this far, a decade before we got the abomination that is Doom in 2005. Uh, another episode plug, we did a Doom movie commentary, so if you want to follow along, it's our 100th episode. Uh, we watched that movie together and did some commentary. It's not a good movie, but it does have Carl Urban and The Rock in it, and that makes it worth a watch, I think. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely worth a watch, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nintendo at this point in time was also helping to make Doom 64, which, unlike Doom for the Super Nintendo, was actually a completely new game made just for the Nintendo 64. So if you played the other Doom games but skipped this one because you thought it was just Doom on the Nintendo 64, it's actually worth its own playthrough. And it was also just re-released on, like, everything, so you don't even have to, like, dig up the old cartridge. Um, I think it's funny because Nintendo for so long was, like, anti-violent games. And then at, towards the end of the Super Nintendo cycle and into the Nintendo 64, they kind of relented on that a bit. Um, I think having a rating system really helped them sort of come around if they were like, well, we can say these games aren't for kids and it's very easy for us to just slap a label on them that says they're, that it's not for kids and then we can feel better about selling it, I think, was kind of how Nintendo was thinking at the I time. I think they also, uh, they also saw dollar signs. That's you know? true, yeah. And the, the people who were playing... Uh, uh nintendo seven or eight years before when they were kids are now growing up right and they're still playing nintendo and we gotta have games for them otherwise sega's gonna eat our lunch i'm saying we as if i am nintendo i'm not i don't work for nintendo um, tyler osby nintendo that's his yeah. full legal name <laughs> that is my full name i heir to the nintendo fortune mm-hmm. <laughs> um so yeah, anyway, Sega was kind of eating Nintendo's lunch at that point in time, and, and they had all the violent video games, they had Mortal Kombat and all that stuff, so they were they were making inroads with that 
that crowd and Nintendo wanted in on it too. So they helped make Doom 64. Uh, but back to Microsoft and specifically Alex St. John. Uh, he loved its games ever since Wolfenstein had come out. And everyone else at Microsoft did too. Uh, not just because Doom was really fun, but also because it was really technically impressive. It was 3D and the graphics and the sounds were amazing. It moved really fast. It was perfect for what Microsoft was trying to do with Windows 95, which was all about sounds and graphics at that time. Uh, Microsoft was all about multimedia like that was like the tech buzzword at the time was multimedia and nobody really knew exactly what that meant it was like one of those oh well i'll know it when i see it um because multimedia was still kind of being invented uh this is at a point in time where uh watching a video file on your computer was mind-blowing like the fact like that you could watch a video on your computer was like oh my goodness what's next you're gonna tell me we can watch movies on our computers like that's crazy that's where we're at in technology time uh, far, a far cry from pulling your phone out of your pocket and streaming a movie immediately from Netflix in 4K, you know? Um, this Dude, was my, a uh, different my time. childhood computer, my Gateway 2000 that my family got that we all shared, like, had it was the first to play music and it had Jules Who Will Save Your Soul on it. And it was just like mind blowing <laughs> at the time. Uh, there was like a, I, th- I, th- I think um, Buddy Holly, the Weezer song, Buddy Holly, I think. Maybe it was Buddy Holly. Maybe it was something around that time was like included with every Windows 95 installation too. Um, I think it was Buddy Holly. Do you think think Weezer was making bucks off that? They had to be, right? Yeah. I'm going to... By the way, anytime now that I go to a store and I see we have multimedia PCs, I'm like, oh, that's just a bad PC. That's what I think immediately. (laughs) (laughs) When they call it multimedia, I'm like, that's not going to play no games. It's going to be terrible. No games. Yeah, it was Buddy Holly. Um, and I think it was the the music video, too. So, wow, big, big deal in Windows 95. And uh, Doom didn't run on Windows. Doom ran on in DOS. Uh, so I, I think you could get it to run within Windows because Windows would run DOS things. But it wasn't like a Windows game. It was definitely a DOS game at the time. Um, so anyway, talking about multimedia. And Alex St. John used to argue with Bill Gates over what multimedia meant. Uh, Gates thought it was more like what Apple was doing with QuickTime with movies and uh, and sound. And uh, they had like this weird like 3D sort of, they called it VR, but it really was not that. Um, Apple did. Um, but what St. John would argue is that games were where multimedia was at. And he wanted Microsoft to make games. And at the time, in the early Windows 95 days and, and before that, Windows was pretty crummy for games, actually. Um, so what Alex St. John did was he led Microsoft in the creation of DirectX, which was a set of systems that made it much easier for game to make games for Windows than it was to make games for DOS. And what he wanted to do to show off DirectX was he wanted to show off a version of Doom that used DirectX. And id was not stoked on that because Carmack was kind of sick of doing Doom ports. He did, like, the Super Nintendo port and the uh, Jaguar port, I think, and, like... He, he was done. He was done doing Doom ports for consoles. He wanted to work on Quake. And so Microsoft did it themselves. They made Doom for Windows them by just on their own. And the crowd went wild for Doom on Windows. Uh, Doom was leading the charge for Microsoft's push for Windows as a gaming platform. That, that makes sense. That makes more sense now why they would have wanted to buy id software because they're like, Doom is our like flagship game on Windows or we want it to be. We should own the company that makes it and, and make sure that their games in the future also support this stuff so that we can continue pushing gaming on windows this was one of the many uh attempts by microsoft to say no no we really do care about pc gaming we really do Uh, something i don't think they've quite nailed until more recently um because there was there was this stuff there was like the games for windows live stuff where they like sort of made it xbox and now we're on to like game pass and stuff um where i think i think they've got it right this time Uh, yeah game pass feels good but that xbox app needs a lot of work yeah Game Pass feels good. Xbox app is a little wonky, um, but I think the strategy of uh, launching all of their first party titles on PC at the same time as Xbox is really what sells it to me, where it's like, oh, they really are like serious about this. They actually don't want exclusives for the Xbox. Uh, they want exclusives for Microsoft. Um, and so that's why I think they're, they're PC gaming. But 20 years ago, that was not the case. Uh, more than 20 years ago, actually. Um, yeah, like 25 years ago. We're, t- we're talking, we're in like 94, 95 era. era. Um, so anyway, one of the things that they decided to do with Doom was hold a big deathmatch tournament at a big Halloween party that was hosted by Microsoft. I guess they used to do big Halloween parties. Maybe they still do, I don't know. Um, but they had brought in top Doom gamers from around the world to come play, and it was a sight to behold. Bill Gates, 
even recorded a video for it that had him like superimposed on Doom gameplay with a shotgun in his hands. It was really goofy. You can find it on YouTube if you want to watch it. There's like a part where he's got like a shotgun in his hands and there's a part where one of the demons like comes up to him and I think asks for an autograph or something and his shotgun fires, but he's holding the gun with both hands by the barrel of the gun, uh, with no fingers on the trigger and the gun just goes off and kills the demon and he says, don't interrupt me. Like a really monotone <laughs> way. He's just like, don't interrupt me. It's uh, really go goofy. That. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find the video for you. We can we can watch it after this. But yeah, I highly recommend it. You can just YouTube Bill Gates Doom commercial. It's like the first thing. Um, so that's what was going on at Microsoft while they're trying to build up their Windows empire. But meanwhile, back at id, there were some rumors of Romero's death circulating around. Um, like they, there was a, somebody had come up with this rumor that he like, crashed his car and died or something. Uh, and it is true that many of the guys at id did wreck their really amazing cars. Uh, I don't think any of them ever really got hurt and Romero hadn't wrecked his car and he was very much alive and well. He kind of took it as a compliment though. The book kind of compares it to a uh, conspiracy theories like the Paul is dead conspiracy theory from the Beatles. Are you familiar with that? Oh, I watched a documentary on it on Netflix and wasted an hour and a half of my life. So yes, I'm very aware of it. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there, apparently there's no Billy Shears to replace Romero, but he was, uh, he was, he was pretty, uh, he, he took it as a compliment. You know, this guy, he, he doesn't let things get to him. Um, but it is still working on Quake and Quake is still in trouble. It's late 1995 and the blame is starting to fall on Romero, probably because he was dead and not contributing. Just kidding. He wasn't dead. Carmack. Was, you got, you had me for a second. Yeah. They're just like, ah, oh, Romero's not doing anything. He's been dead for so long. He's just really not contributing. Um, Romero's been dead for 10 years. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Carmack could make the engine, sure, but they didn't have any like direction, no design, no art style, no gameplay ideas. Carmack knew what he wanted to do technically, and he was deep in the rabbit hole of creating this like first fully 3D uh, graphics engine, uh, but they didn't have a game to go along with it. Kevin and Adrian kept making textures that nobody knew where the game was going, and it felt like Romero just didn't care. He had like, there was some like vague direction on like, maybe it's kind of medieval we're gonna have like a hammer and it's gonna be the quake the hammer and it was like that was really all they had to go off of and romero thought this was fine he was like no this is the game's coming along great um but it wasn't uh and and he was kind of just like well let's wait for carmack to make the engine and then we'll really dive in and we'll get this get this taken care of uh for now just wait for him to do do the engine stuff and we'll work on side projects and everything's gonna be okay but everybody was mad at Romero for that though. They thought he was abandoning them. And truthfully, he just had other priorities now. He had a wife and a house, you know, a life to attend to. It was doing great. And it wasn't like they were floundering and about to go out of business. Like Doom was still raking it in. Uh, he, Romero figured, you know, we can kind of kick our feet up a little bit here, take a little bit of a break. It's okay. Um, but Sandy Peterson was starting to think maybe they should get rid of him. So oh, Sandy. Yeah, Sandy starts to starts the, the gears turn in here. Um, because at that time, Carmack didn't seem too upset. He was getting going further and further into, into Quake. Uh, and if he didn't have a whole lot of social skills before, uh, but at this point in time, he was really struggling to connect with the other people at id. He was singularly focused on Quake, at least the engine for Quake. Um, and he needed to, too, because of all the ideas he had for the engine. The, this new engine could not be built off of old Doom technology. Like, he couldn't just take that old stuff and, like, add on to it. He basically had to build the whole thing again from scratch. So he was, like, in it super deep, just totally consumed by this. He thought about Quake when he wasn't working on it. He dreamt about Quake while he slept. There was no escape. And he, to be quite honest, the pressure was starting to get to him, and he was kind of taking it out on some of the other employees. Um, there's one point where he was sending emails, giving everyone in the office a grade based on their performance. He was like super angry that people there didn't seem to be working as hard as him or care as much about what they were building. Um, it got so tense that even jokes couldn't lighten the mood. So the book tells a story about how Mike Wilson had ordered a stripper to deliver a pizza to like try and lighten the mood, which flashback to the 90s, I guess that was okay. Totally not okay to do now. Maybe it yeah, wasn't okay not then. Cool to do now. <laughs> I, it probably wasn't okay then either, but I guess it was the 90s and stuff happens uh, but nobody cared they were all just like no nope nobody ordered a pizza none of us ordered a pizza like they just didn't get it at all and so she just like took the pizza and left <laughs> they didn't even take the pizza wow they didn't even take the pizza yeah they must really be committed to their job yeah uh, they, they were didn't super even eat the pizza i know and then they still got bad grades from carmack when he's sending out all these emails 
It turned down so pizza rude. for you, Carmack. So rude. Uh, but eventually Carmack did get really upset with Romero. He thought that he had ab- abandoned work to go off and be like a celebrity rock star or something. So what he did was he installed a program to monitor when Romero was working. And it did not please Carmack. So he just like blew up at Romero. He wanted to fire him or at least put him on notice that he needed to shape up. So they got back to work on Quake, but they'd moved away from the little design ideas that they'd originally had, and they went back to what they knew. Guns and rocket launchers, as uh, American McGee said, I think. Let's go back to (laughs) making guns and rocket launchers. Uh, So they basically decided to just make Doom 3, and Romero was livid. But they didn't have any other direction to go off of, and they wanted to get something done, so Doom 3 is kind of what they wanted to make. Um, And like looking back on the original Quake, you're like, yep, it's just Doom, but in 3D. Um, I don't know if I'd call it Doom 3 because it's not the same like aesthetic, but it is it's very similar gameplay. Um, but they had all these art assets that they'd been making for a whole year. It was all medieval fantasy stuff, and Adrian and Kevin didn't want to just throw it all away. But it, this is where something clicked in Romero. Uh, like the book often talks about him flipping his bit, like once he sort of decides on something or realizes something, like that's it, you can't stop him. And so I think he flipped a bit at this point. The, he realized that they didn't all want the same thing. Romero wanted the game to be equal parts tech innovation and gameplay innovation but everybody else just wanted to make a good game like the stuff they'd already made maybe quake 2 could be the big revolution romero wanted but for now with no direction and no path forward they basically decided they just had to make doom 3 in this awesome new technical game engine so romero relented but he knew where this was headed he was gone he was gonna leave at this point he knew it so as badly as quake was doing on being built doom 2's second holiday on the market so this is in 1995 holiday 1995 it was still selling like hotcakes and gangbusters the game was still good and people were still buying of it and tens of millions of dollars were still being raked in off of doom 2 alone not to mention further sales of doom 1 because that game's still good and people still want to play that gti was rolling in it and when they went public in 1995 it was the largest venture capital backed ipo of the year to put that in perspective that's the same year that netscape went public netscape that so we are we're peak 90s right now when we're yeah, talking I think about we, Netscape. We mentioned Netscape last episode, too. Netscape Navigator. You know, yeah. this is full 90s. Yeah, you know? we I are just, I'm, full I'm 90s. wearing LA gears right now as while we're doing this podcast. Yeah, and they, they light up while you walk. Yeah, and on my belt, I have like 17 Tamagotchis just yeah. ready to go. I got to feed yeah. all of them during this podcast. Will they survive? I'll <laughs> tell knows? you later. Giant Jinko jeans? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So GTI's success, though, was not that exciting for id. They kind of thought GTI was not great, and so they refused a lot of offers to be bought out by GTI. They thought GTI was taking too much credit for the success of Doom 2, and also they were kind of upset because they kept going out and backing bad games by other companies. So id was kind of like, we don't really need you anymore. Um, They figured out a way to sell and distribute their game without GTI. So for Quake, they kind of went back to their roots. They went with shareware. GTI still sold... A version of Quake, I think, um, but it renegotiated to have the rights to do the shareware version of the game. So what they would do is they would sell the shareware version on a CD for ten dollars, and then you could call up ID and get a code to unlock the rest of the game for fifty dollars. So they kind of cut GTI out with that. I'm not sure how they got their shareware CDs into stores to sell for ten dollars. Maybe they sold them directly. The book isn't clear on. Like I think the logistics this, of that. Uh, this was one of those things where it was like the original Doom deal, where they were like, you can just take this merchandise and sell it yourself. Like we'll give it to you for free basically. Oh, okay. The, I don't know where like this $10 the, comes from then. Well, the, so they, the CDs sell in the stores for $10 and the comp, like the Walmart or whoever is selling it makes all the money. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, like I'm pretty sure that way it worked is it loses money on the shareware to make the $50 afterward. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and they didn't even like, so they could sell you the whole game by putting the entire game on the CD and then they just required a code for you to unlock the rest of the game. So you didn't have to download it because Quake was kind of too big to download, I think at this point. Yeah. For and also we're going to get to why this was a little bit problematic later on. <laughs> okay. I'm excited now. Um, So with that stuff kind of ironed out, the team was in full-on crunch mode for Quake. They got some more office space, they tore down the walls so they could all work together, and that's the way that Carmack wanted it. He didn't like that people were all, like, in their own little offices. He wanted to, like, sit next to each other and, like, be in the trenches working on code and stuff. Um, Like, he he liked that. He didn't like the death schedule that they had set up, um, which was rough. They were working 18-hour days, seven days a week. 
Romero hated it. It wasn't fun. It was work. And he was on his way out at this point. And like, I think it was the, like the writing was kind of on the wall. Some people sort of knew this is where this was going. So there was like a little bit of Game of Thrones vying for power in here. Like who was going to replace Romero when he inevitably left? American McGee, Tim Willits, the, the guy that they hired straight from the modding community. So there was a lot of internal struggle at this point. Uh, but work on Quake continued. And Carmack one day announced that the first levels of Quake would be Tim Willits's levels, not John Romero's levels. Um, which, Whoa. Yeah, which understandably made Romero pretty mad. Because um, he was like, I'm the lead designer. What the heck? Why aren't my levels the first levels? I also think it's interesting that Carmack is the one who gets to make that decision. Because you'd think that the designers would be the ones in charge of that. Like, Carmack, you go make your engine. We'll make, our, make the levels and decide on the rest of the game. And it's weird that he gets to just, like, come out and be like, these are what we're doing. Um, There's, like, a weird power struggle there, though, where because, like, I think they mentioned it in a previous chapter that Romero, Adrian, and then um, Tom and... Uh, Jim, they all knew, or Jay, they all knew that without Carmack, id couldn't work because oh. Carmack is id because his engines are what makes their game so great. And if they didn't have him, they would lose. So I think what kind of ended up happening is naturally the course of this became Carmack's in charge. Okay. Sl- over. I think that's kind of what happened and what they're insinuating. Because yeah, I thought the same thing when it said Carmack announced that Tim would make the levels. I'm like. But aren't they all the same? And then I realized that chapter from before where it's like, yeah, he's he's kind of holds all the cards. He's kind of the he boss. Because if these... he walks, he takes everyone with him, basically. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so speaking of Tom, though, you were just mentioning Tom Hall, which was uh, one of the guys that, that had, had worked at it a long time ago. Um, he had gone on to work at 3D Realms, which made Duke Nukem, and he... Uh, suggested, well, Romero found him and suggested that they start a new company, a new company where design was king, not technology. Romero was kind of sick of Carmack calling the shots here, and he wanted a company that basically flipped that around and said, like, no, the designers are the ones that make the call. So at this point, Carmack had started uploading his dot .plan files to the internet to sort of let fans know what he was working on every day. That's crazy. Like, I can't imagine, like, putting my to-do list up on the internet and then like marking off what what i got done and what i didn't like just for the entire internet to see um but uh carmack was kind of sick of romero just boasting and making unrealistic promises and he thought maybe the fans would really appreciate like some hard data on what was actually happening every day um so i guess that makes sense they also yeah. they also uploaded a test deathmatch level to see how it worked on other people's computers it wasn't great uh but people were like kind of optimistic about it still it hurt that people weren't as excited as they'd hoped. They had this kind of strange patchwork of levels to put together at this point. Um, And uh, like some of them were medieval, some of them were futuristic, some were like weird gothic puzzle things. It wasn't very cohesive and they needed to fix that. And they were like, that's what they had left to do. And they were still feeling down by um, the, uh, the test not going super well. Um, So they still had this to do. And so what they did to sort of make all of that make sense was they added a story they uh, like like a really bare bones story about slipgate devices and teleporters and like space stuff. It sort of explained why all the levels were so different. That story does not carry forward into future Quake games, that's for sure. Um, but they finished it. They really did. They finally finished Quake. And when it was time to upload the shareware version to the internet, like in the old days of Wolfenstein and Doom, Romero was all by himself at the office. He, he was going to hit the button at five, and everyone had left. Um, the book says they were broken, which is, dang, dude. Yikes. That's crazy. Yeah, that's depressing. Yeah. So at this point, they had all kind of decided it was time to let Romero go. Uh, he and Carmack had grown too far apart, and Romero was no longer right for id. And it was hard. Romero was a founding member of the company, and Carmack thought Romero had lost his programmer roots, and Romero thought that Carmack had lost his gamer roots. And so there was just no reconciliation here. But don't worry about Romero, because like I said just a few minutes ago, he's already laying the groundwork for his new super studio where design was law. So Romero left, and a new era started at id. Oh, yeah. And then so chapter chapter. 13 kind of starts out with talking about Quake and it coming out and how it essentially changed video games. And it didn't necessarily change video games because of its single player, because as Tyler said, it was kind of a mishmash of all these levels put together with the very weak story connected them all but it was the online multiplayer for quake like even more so than doom like this was like crazy it even got like 
gushed upon like by all the reviews and even Robin Williams talked about it on Letterman. Like he talked about Quake oh. on late night TV, which is that's bananas, how you know it's you good. Know? So the multiplayer had 16 players divided up into two teams, and it was essentially like a paintball style match, you know, where you frag other players and kill them and get a score. And it became super competitive. Like this is where land party culture kind of really started. It started a little bit with Doom. Don't get me wrong, but this is where it became into like full swing land party culture. Um, yeah. So, and we had a video game that actually, this was where clans started to form. The idea of video game clans, which Ooh. I think is pretty big now, you know? Mm-hmm. Granted, I would argue that you probably had clans before when you were talking about your like muds and mushes and like RPG stuff. But this is like, no, we're going to be the best team ever that played Quake and we're going to get really good and we're going to play it for eight hours every night and it's going to be amazing. That's kind of where this started. So uh, people wanted to make Quake a spectator sport. And to highlight this, at the time, the book talks about two players in the Quake scene. Uh, Clint Roberts, a.k.a. Fook was his name, and uh, Stevie Case. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. But, uh, needless to say, they were like two opposing teams facing off in a heated championship to win the best in Kansas, you know? And because mm-hmm. everyone knows, that's where I, the, the hotbed of video gaming is Kansas. Kansas. Uh, so the match was between Stevie of Impulse 9 and Fook of the Ruthless Bastards was the name of their teams. And Impulse 9 wins, spoilers, from 1997. So they kind of oh, do man. that to foreshadow something coming up. But the only place that didn't have Quake Deathmatch Fever, as I'm going to call it, was id software yeah john romero's absence was huge and they really felt it and american mcgee actually said the office just lost its soul and it's oh, fun dang. yeah it got really depressing and um uh, not to mention that the as we spoke about before with that quake deal um essentially the retail shareware idea that they had did not work at all oh bummer so it sounded like it, a good idea yeah, well, what ended up happening, so you're supposed to call this 800 number and pay your 50 bucks to get a password. Well, people are really good at modding and hacking, so they just found a way to access this, and so oh, no man. one was paying. Everyone found the passcode, and they got Quake for free. Bummer. And, yeah, and it couldn't really back out of the deal. Like At that time, they had 150,000 shareware CDs sitting in their warehouse, ready to go out to stores, and... Their business with GTI was also falling apart. Like they actually tried to have GTI take those 150,000 extra discs in their warehouse. And they were kind of like, what, why would we do this? Like you're the ones that tried to cut us out of the retail (laughs) deal, you know, which is funny because sales for Quake were way lower compared to Doom 2. Even though when I say way lower, they still sold 250,000 units, but compared to Doom 2, it was not a ton. And this is kind of the moment that it was like, you know what? We're done. We can do this. And they wanted to publish themselves. Like this is them talk. They're starting to have the conversation about publishing games themselves. And they really need to convince Carmack. John Carmack is the one they need to tell like, hey, he's this the was boss. Adrian and Kevin being like, we need to start publishing games ourselves. But Carmack was actually having the time of his life right now. Romero was gone. There was no more death matching into the wee hours of the night, and there was no more promising things to the community that weren't there or ready. <laughs> you know, like that was mm-hmm. the big problem that Carmack had with Romero, I think, at this point, was the hype man that doesn't fact check before he says something. So, classic Romero. Co- classic Romero. They, they call that pulling a Romero, you know? Um, <laughs> but now that the company was working on Quake 2, Carmack could work on getting better 3D acceleration in PC gaming. So these were the, like in arcade machines at the time, 3d acceleration. Cause they're built for this, you know, like they can handle it. Yeah. Like expansion but it had never cards. Been really, yeah. Done on a PC before. So Carmack worked with a manufacturer of graphics cards called 3d FX. And he converted a version of quake to open GL and open GL was a format which ran on 3d FX's new voodoo 3d accelerator cards. And Carmack did this in a weekend, by That's the way. That's crazy. He just made it, yeah. And this caused players who owned those Voodoo 3D accelerator cars to get 20% improvements on speed and making the game just so much smoother. Uh, 3D acceleration was here, and they would never go back. And Carmack once again started a movement, and that movement being high-performance graphics cards. Like, this is, I think, kind of where it begins for they that. Still, uh, they're still going. We got... 
new NVIDIA cards dropping very soon. I think they're, they might already be out now. But, like, yeah, those things are still going crazy right now. Yeah, and this is, like, kind of the early time of Carmack being, like, hey, I'm going to put it on this crazy graphics card, and this caused players to start getting high-performance graphics cards for their PC. Um, and Carmack was also working on Quake World, which was another service thing that he was adding into OpenGL. It was fully free, and this project's sole purpose was to make the game network better. So now the game looked better, and it played better, and you could play with more people than you ever could before. Like, he just improved Quake so much by doing these two things. Um, but there were still problems internally at id. So there was kind of a great exodus of some original id employees. Jay Wilbur quit. Uh, He was their business manager. Remember all the way from softest days he left. I think the really depressing thing (laughs) in the book is they were like, he, his son asked him why he never goes to his little league games, (laughs) which is just like heartbreaking. (laughs) Yeah. And then he's like, Oh yeah, my whole life has been in software. And so he quits and does something else. Um, Michael Labrash went back to Microsoft. As you recall, he was kind of uh, recruited from Microsoft and they ended up going back, which is kind of exactly what Bill Gates said he would do, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, Classic. And then Sandy Peterson was let go. In the book, it says that he was clashing with management. And from my understanding, the only management is Carmack. So I don't know where their disagreement came from, but it doesn't really go into elaborate detail on that. And then Mike Wilson and Sean Green left to go work for Romero, which we'll get to in a second. So this actually got so bad where people on the internet were like, oh my gosh, it's falling apart. Look at all these people leaving. Like Romero was it. Everything's dying. That John Carmack, Mr. I don't want to talk to anybody, had to make a public statement in a long email interview. And this is a quote directly from the book Masters of Doom. Lots of people will read that they, that what they like into the departures from id, but our development team is at least as strong as now as it has ever been. Romero was pushed out of id because he wasn't working hard enough. I believe that three programmers, three artists and three level designers can still create the best games in the world. We are scaling back our publishing biz so that we are mostly just a developer. This was always a major point of conflict with Romero. He wants an empire. I just want to create good programs. Everyone is happy now. Hmm. <laughs> and like so that. three programmers, three artists, and three level designers, and that's that's it. Meanwhile, I'm looking at like the credits for the latest Assassin's Creed, and it's like thousands of names long. Yeah, right? It's it's crazy to me. And I also think what really shows Carmack versus Romero here, I just want to create good programs. Like, not, not games. even games. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Just programs. So, uh, Romero, they suspect, this is like the book speculation, they think he got $10 million as severance for leaving Wow. Aid. Yeah, which is a lot of money. And he was now on the way to make games he wanted to make. And Romero started his new company by renting a 22,500 square foot loft on the top building in the penthouse, but like a skyscraper in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the office, by the way, $15 a square foot. So $350,000 a month for rent. <sighs> wow. Yeah. And he called this company Dream Design. That was the name he started with. Okay. Romero's plan was to have three designers working on three different games at once. He would just license the Quake engine from id. That's the crazy part, is he could still, like, use the id engine. He just had to pay for it now, like everyone else. So with that, he started searching for publishers. So his deal was pretty brash, is how they would describe it in the book. Uh, He would ask publishers when he was, like, searching for a publisher. He would say, I want $3 million up front full rights to my IP, the full rights of port to any console or platform I like, and 40% of the royalties. And that's, yeah, that's like pretty tough, like business, like this is the deal. But Romero was wined and dined by all these publishers because they wanted the famous John Romero of Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake to make their next big game that makes them tons of money. And the plan this time, because he said three designers, so Romero would make a shooter, Uh, Tom Hall would make a role-playing adventure game, and then they had a new designer named Todd Porter, and he would make the third game that they don't really discuss at this point. Uh, And a little bit about Todd Porter, by the way. This is pretty amazing. Uh, He originally started as a preacher. He wanted to be a preacher. Okay. Had a falling out. Then he worked as an exotic dancer named Preacher (laughs) Boy. (laughs) This is true. Delivering pizzas. 
delivering pizzas to the ad offices. No. Um, <laughs> and he used that money to learn programming, and he finally ended up getting a job with Richard Garriott's company, Origin, Richard Garriott, of uh, famous early RPG fame. Okay. Lord Ultima, British anybody? himself. Um, and so he started, he worked for Richard Gary's origin, which was in Austin, Texas. And he started his own company after leaving origin called seventh level. And when that company was folding is when Romero came in and swooped him up essentially. Nice. And right after he swooped up, uh, our, our new friend, Todd Porter, uh, they were all brainstorming in a McDonald's like you do, you know, mm-hmm. writing That's the I do all my best brainstorming. Yeah. And they decided to change the name of the company from dream design to Ion Storm. And then on Christmas Eve, the newly found company, Ion Storm, made a publishing deal with Eidos Interactive. And Eidos Interactive is a British publishing company. Uh, they made Tomb Raider, for example. Okay. Very famous. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. so that's kind of where they're looking at. Um, and their first game made by Ion Storm would be Dai Katana. Oh, yeah. So in Dai Katana, you play Hiro Miyamoto. This was the pitch who must stop Cage Mishima, Mishima, an evil scientist who just stole the magic time traveling Dai Katana, a blade of Miyamoto's ancestors. So you have to fight through time. Okay. Wasn't that one of and the so also, swords from Carmack's uh, D&D campaigns? It was. And so what's weird is they get around any legal ramifications, apparently, because they don't mention this being a problem. Because <laughs> Dai Katana is 100% from John Carmack's D&D campaign. I guess he should have copyrighted his D&D campaign. That's right. So He never okay. would. This is John Carmack. He probably didn't even throw a fit about it. No, he probably didn't. Because honestly, this story was... I think if I recall, the Dai Katana in the D&D campaign was like owned by a demon or something. It was, it was just completely different. So uh, Romero actually wanted this game to be huge, though. He wanted it to be a really, really big game. And when I say big, I mean four times the size of Quake. Dang. He wanted a hundred levels, advanced AI, a ton of monsters. Like he got a giant team put together for this. He had Mike Wilson was on board. It was a new person for their business savvy, as you know, from id. Okay. Mm-hmm. New hire, but really just from id, just pull on id, id, some id fellas into the mix. Uh, Sean Green from id was there, pulled in for coding. And then Romero actually had like an open application for fans and modders of id games. To fill out the rest oh, of the roster. That's and a this good is idea. Because cool. he's like finding people that started the in the game industry like him by like just making games on your own. So the, uh, some famous people from this, Brian Iserlo, uh was actually, fa- he was, we mentioned him earlier, I think. They used to do these naked doom hacking parties where everyone would do it naked. I don't know why. It's a college thing. Okay. <laughs> that seems weird. <laughs> yeah. But he sent his application in the form of a medieval short story, and that got Romero's attention, so he was hired. Uh, Will Lacanto quit an industrial band named Information Society to join Ion Storm as a sound designer, and Sver Quermo left Norway to become Romero's lead designer. So he's getting people all over the world that just know how famous Romero is to join Ion Storm. And one other person that joined Ion Storm was Stevie Case at the beginning mm-hmm, of the chapter, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the competitive player. She actually joined I, uh, um, the company after she beat John Romero in a death match. So they played one death match of Quake and Romero won. And then she asked for a rematch and then Stevie won. And then Romero hired her and he also made a shrine on the web in her honor. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> um, but she was hired to do QA and level design. So by the way, the press completely jumped all in on the Ion Storm hype train. Like they were all on board. Um, totally makes sense. I would too if yeah. I were the press in the in those days. Yeah, because I mean, this also this office was like the office of video game rock stars. They had land parties in the office. They had a movie theater in the office. They had game rooms. Um, they had, Mike actually just dis- from uh, Mike from it. Mike Wilson described the office as the Willy Wonka chocolate factory of gaming. <laughs> they just had <laughs> kind of you know when you think of like tech companies now having crazy like campuses. I think this was kind of the beginning of that. You know, yeah, of, like yeah. we're gonna have all this free fun stuff. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So Eidos Interactive uh, sent Ion Storm on a press tour, which they called the No Excuses Tour, because as they said, it was time to put up or shut up with Dai Katana. <laughs> um, Ion Storm and id Software could not be farther apart. 
as far as a business philosophy goes. Um, Ion Storm was entirely devoted to designing great games with gameplay and stories, while id Software was really more of a technology company first that happened to make games. And Romero even told Wired magazine that id, after he left, was gloomy. And this is kind of an important point in the history because this is where Romero really starts tearing apart id Software in the press. Like the press, mm-hmm. of course, would be on Romero's side because they love like juicy gossip, you know, and he was always willing to talk to them. Um, they would call him like the creative mind behind Doom and Wolfenstein, you know. And Carmack honestly mostly ignored it because he's John Carmack and he wants to program and he doesn't care. But yeah, other care. It employees like Kevin and Adrian silently like grumbled in the background. But there was an employee named Paul Steed who was a new hire. He was like a super buff guy, got like from a hard life. He went to war, you know, he was like going to war. For it, not he went to war. In real, he went to war for it. I I, re- I realize now that I, I completely said that wrong. I do not know if he had military service, but he did go to war for id software. Metaphorical <laughs> war. So uh, Romero could still come by id's office, which is what I thought was weird. Like he'd talk a lot of smack, but then he would just show up at the id software office because they're in the same city, you know, in yeah, Dallas. Yeah, yeah. And he'd just hang out, and then Paul Steed was finally like, you know what? We should go to their office and see what's up at their office. <laughs> and then <laughs> they go to his office, uh, Romero's office and the Ion Storm office, and they're just showed around. But then Paul saw while walking around, one of the artists was using outdated software and he called it out on his public plan file oh, that no. he shared. Yeah. And that is how the plan file wars begun. So Paul and Romero were like at each other's throats in these plan files, like making fun of each other. And it finally got to the point that Paul like essentially threatened to beat Romero up. Uh, And he (laughs) says, quote, I will kick your ass back into the doom days where you wish you were here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that's when it got really heated. And then Carmack finally decided to take notice. And instead of like trying to calm down the situation, Carmack had an interview with time magazine. And he essentially called Romero out. He said Romero didn't do anything and was fired for doing nothing. And Romero shot back saying that it was too limiting, too small, too small thinking. And it all came to a head at E3 in 1997, where Quake 2 and Daikatana would face off. And Quake 2 would be quite the competition because the game had a story now. You know how we said in Quake 1, there was really no story. It was kind of, in fact terrible and just connected yep. with these weird gates uh based in uh they, they actually made a story for quake 2 that was based on a 1961 world war ii movie called the guns of navarone and when i say based on i mean they just used it as like inspiration because in the movie it's in world war ii and they have to take out these two giant guns in a mountain fortress and in quake 2 you played a marine that had to stop an alien race called the Strogs from turning humans into evil cyborgs. And to defeat the Strog and their cyborg army, you had to storm a fortress and destroy a big gun, kind of like the movie The Guns of Navarone. So okay. uh, the best part about this game, though, is it ran with hardware and software acceleration. So if you had Quake 2 at the time, it looked amazing. Yeah. And that was the big thing that they had going for it. Like, it was a well-oiled machine at this point okay like Carmack's vision of uh buckling down and getting work done had come to life like they had a new ceo his name was todd hollinshead they had a new lead designer tim willits that actually you mentioned before um and like in a plan file right before e3 Carmack said i doubt i can convey just how well things are going here and everyone's like <laughs> sure whatever you know and then romero goes to E3 like a rock star and people are bowing to him doing the we're not worthy thing like he's used to. And uh, this is also when they released the famous ad, which I don't know. Oh, can I the say? Daikatana ad. Can I say this ad on? I mean, we're a clean podcast. I mean, it's a uh, it was it was printed in many a magazine. That's true. OK, it, the, the ad was essentially just said big text said John Romero is about to make you his bitch. <laughs> it said suck it down underneath because that was what he would always say when he beat people in Doom. <laughs> and this was Mike's idea in the uh, on the team. He's like, come on, we got to just bring some of our own culture like into this game. And so that's kind of how they look with Daikatana is they really going for like the edgy, you know, they're being the 
the Sega to to id Software's Nintendo right now. If you're thinking, oh about yeah, it. that makes sense. Yeah, they they had to go, they had to go uh, all out in assault. That's right. They had to go all out. So unfortunately for Romero, though, uh, no one was really impressed with Daikatana at E3 and their sweet snowy Norway level because everyone was huddled around the id booth, and what Romero saw there was another like hint of greatness from John Carmack. And that was dynamic color lighting. Like the gun in the demo at E3 in 1997 shot a yellow bullet out of it. And as the bullet went down the hall, the light followed it, which doesn't sound pretty crazy, but at the time it's pretty crazy. That was some like mind, like life changing stuff back then. Yeah. And it would make the game just look so much more detailed. Like you could have like different colored lights on in different areas and how things would react. It just made the world feel more new. And this was a big problem for John Romero and Ion Storm because they were running the Quake 1 engine. And Mm. this game, Quake 2, is obviously running on the next brand new engine for id Software, which meant that contractually, John Romero would have to wait until Quake 2 came out in Christmas of 1997 before he could put that sweet game engine onto Die Katana. That's like contractually when they're licensing, that's something they have to wait for id's game to come out first before they can get the newest technology. Yeah, because they couldn't do they couldn't put this game out with the original Quake engine. It'd be old. Yeah, and it would look terrible. Even though it really wouldn't look terrible, it just wouldn't look like what they wanted. So essentially once again, John Romero is forced to change his plans because of John Carmack's technology. And he doesn't even work with him anymore. <laughs> he just has <laughs> to change his whole thing. Uh, so what this meant for John Romero is his plan now was to design Dai Katana as it is. And then when they get access to the Quake 2 engine, convert the entire game to the new engine with what they have. That had to be their plan. Uh, there was another important note, too, about E3 in 1997, which was the famous Red Annihilation Deathmatch tournament took place where the the winner would get John Carmack's Red Ferrari 328. Wow. Um, yeah. The, like, if you won the game, you got – if you won the tournament, you got just to drive off with his Ferrari 328. Uh, <laughs> The final two of the 16-person tournament was Tom Entropy Kismi of the University of Kansas Impulse 9 team, the same person that played with Stevie, as we recall, with Stevie Case, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and Dennis Thresh Fong, who won the first official deathmatch tournament put on by Microsoft, which was called Judgment Day. Uh, spoilers to a 1997 game tournament, Thresh won. Uh, Carmack handed him the keys, and then he asked thresh or dennis how he was going to get the car home and and he was like i guess i'll just ship it and then carmack was like okay just a second and he walked away and then a half hour later he came back and gave five thousand dollars cash to dennis (laughs) so he could ship the car home dang (laughs) which i mean hey you know i feel like carmack is definitely like a weird dude i think we can all imagine that as far as like socially but he is a kind-hearted person you know Mm -hmm. he even said i think during this like why he did this in the book, and I didn't write this down, so hopefully I'm not completely screwing this up. But uh, he said, essentially, he because of id Software, he got to purchase four Ferraris. So he thought Dang. it was only fair that he gave one back to the community. You Holy know? moly. That's a lot of Ferraris. Yeah. That's four more Ferraris than I have. That's four more Ferraris than I will ever own, I believe. Yeah. Uh, but E3 1997 ended, actually, not just with that tournament, but with Romero going over to the id booth and saying hi to everyone and actually playing Deathmatch against his old friends and employees and Romero and Carmack were the last ones to play deathmatch against each other. And Romero won, of course, because he plays deathmatch all the time, but pretty soon, like we're going to have a new deathmatch and that deathmatch is quake two versus die Katana. Who will Ooh. win? What will happen? Can't wait. Find out next time on the thrilling episode of codex, a history of video games. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler, what you've been playing? Uh, this week I put more, some more time into Genshin Impact. Uh, I'm getting a little bit more into it. I still don't like the randomness of, of like getting new characters with like basically having to do slot machine pulls. I really don't like that, but the, the Breath of the Wild stuff is really fun. The battle system is pretty fun. Um, so I'm like slowly starting to warm up to it. I'm still pretty committed at this point to not spend any money on it. Um, except I think they have like a battle pass thing. I don't really mind spending money on battle passes, but like I'm not going to spend money on uh slot machine polls i don't think um i think that's pretty much it though i uh i haven't really been playing too much i've been watching a lot of 
uh, Worlds is going on this month for League of Legends, so I've been keeping up on uh, on all of that. North America has been not uh, doing poorly, so so bad. It's very sad. Uh, but my bracket remains mostly intact. I, I got Group B a little bit wrong, but uh, otherwise uh, I got everything else right. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that pretty much covers the, the games I've been playing. Uh, what have you been playing? Well, I've been uh, playing actually Animal Crossing again. Pick that oh, up. Back into it. For the Halloween stuff, it's pretty fun. And just like a little thing I check in on every day just for funsies. Uh, also, I bought and I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3 in early Ooh. access on Steam. I really wanted this game. And I was like, you know what? You don't normally support early access, Mike. This is not you. But this is video game D&D. And you love D&D. So I bought it and I have zero regrets. Um, All right. I found out. Like, it's definitely buggy. There's some weird things that happen a lot during the cinematic dialogue scenes. Mm -hmm. But um, the one really major gameplay bug I have where the game just, like, dipped to unplayable frame rates, I just switched to DirectX, and it worked totally fine. Because you can either run it in DirectX 11 or in Vulkan, and Mm. DirectX 11 just works better. So I did that. And I've played a lot. I put, like, eight hours in this week, I think, which is pretty good. Yeah, really fun. And I'm, like, fully knowing that I'm going to play this game and then probably when the real game comes out, have to restart and just start from fresh. So I'm really, it's kind of fun playing with like not caring. Like if I fail a role, I just sit with it, you know, I yeah. just deal with it. And I'm just like, if I'm failing, I just fail. And it's actually kind of fun to play it like D&D. You know, you can't load a save in D&D. And I feel like that's the way this game was meant to be played is you just play it and you don't load out unless you die. Then you load from your last save. But yeah. my only advice, if you wanted to play Baldur's Gate 3 right now, would be to just constantly hit F5 every two minutes, which is the quick save key, because mm. I have lost so much progress early on by not doing I had to play the tutorial twice, essentially, because uh, I just forgot to autosave. It, it doesn't autosave. And like- yeah, and it had, I had a really bad bug. So, uh, but yeah, it's actually really fun, and it, it's, it's, it's gonna, I think it's really going to be a great game. Because, I mean, Divinity Original Sin 2 was the one I also played for a little bit, and that's a really great game. And I know that they make good stuff. So I'm all in on the Baldur's Gate 3 train. I also tried to boot up Destiny this week. And I just couldn't do it. Yeah. I played for like 10 minutes. I had zero desire to keep playing. I don't I, I don't really care about the FOMO anymore. I'm just going to wait until the new season comes out. And even then, I'm kind of like, I might not even get it right away. I might just wait. Yeah, we'll see what, see what people think. Yeah, so. But yeah pretty much my week uh I, we got one email you want to read it sure cool this is from brett aka grime bucket he says hey mike and tyler i'm finally caught up on your episode backlog and it feels good i'd like to suggest that you add a what you've been playing channel to the discord i love hearing about the games that the two of you play each week and you've influenced me to add several new titles to my ever-growing backlog i'd love to hear what other folks in the community are playing as well thanks and keep making episodes brett aka grind bucket well brett today you probably saw it already but i added that discord channel oh that's right, right. we have a what you've been playing discord channel tyler did you know that i saw it earlier today and i was like yeah this is great this is everything we need so it made it made so much sense but that's brett's channel if anyone asks the what you've been playing channel is all brett he is the admin and moderator of that channel. Nothing I'm saying is true, but still, it's <laughs> a ceremonial. He's like British nobility, okay? He, he has ceremonial power over that channel. Yes, and can dissolve all of uh, Parliament and exactly. Codex leadership at a moment's exactly. notice. Exactly. But I, I, put, I put that on there, and it's been really fun. I've been like monitoring it all day. Uh, just I typed what you've been playing, and I've just been seeing what people have been playing. It's kind of neat. Yeah, I like it a lot, and it made me happy. Uh, so it's a great idea. Thank you so much, Brett, for the email and for the suggestion. And if you want to join that discord, you can email us at codex history podcast at gmail.com. And I will just send you the link via email, or you can go to my Twitter account at me Coletta, M E C O L E T T A. And then you can just click the pinned tweet the top of there. And you don't have to be in Twitter to do that. My Twitter is public. You can just Google Mike, Coletta Twitter and then it will pop up and then you can just click that link and you can just jump right into the conversation if you don't Perfect. want to join Twitter. Yeah. So uh, we also got one new review. That's exciting. Ooh. Yeah, this is on Apple Podcast Review. This is from Protofessor. I think I Proto-fessor. said that right. Protofessor. That's good. Yeah, Protofessor. P-R-O-T-O-F-E-S-O-R. It says, gamers, 
Five stars. I love these episodes. I listen to them while I do homework. And that's it. Thank you so much, Pro cool. Professor. Thanks, Pro Professor. People are listening to it while you do That's it. You're double learning. If yeah, you're doing I'm glad homework. you're doing your homework. Yeah. Glad you're doing homework. You're double learning by listening to a podcast about learning. And then you're what you're learning with your homework. That's, it's that's, ed- that's edu- multitasking. Education inception. Uh, yeah. Did you say edgeception? Edgeception, yeah. That's good. That's real good. Oh, man. Anyway, that's the episode today. <laughs> I liked it. I think next week, I kind of want to do something Halloween-y. Ooh, halloween Do you do scary yeah. video games? Have we done scary I, video games before? We've done some scary video games, but I kind of want to do a big name scary video game. And I might, I might, I'm not going to say what it is, but I, it's been, it's been uh, twitching around in my, in my brains for a little bit. And I feel oh. like we got to get a little halloween on it. I'm ready. I'm excited. So it's like we're taking a little break next week from id mm-hmm. and then we're going to get all halloweeny maybe a couple maybe a couple weeks i don't know we'll see how we're feeling and how people mm-hmm. are feeling it but uh, i know we don't have a plan here we're just there. flying by the seat of our pants what's that so we don't have a plan here we're just flying by the seat of our pants we really are there is zero <laughs> planning taking place that's why we have people tell us what discord channels to add thank you again Brent. that's a really that's <laughs> that's an idea that i was like how come i didn't think about doing that immediately <laughs> But good thing Brett's on top of it. Any suggestions you guys want to email us? CodexHistoryPodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear them. We really are flying by the seat of our pants here. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And Id, Tyler, you got to say bye to everybody. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. 